So we move on to our um, sixth special topic, and this is going to be about micromechanics and a closely related uh, concept, namely homogenization. So these are um, two topics, actually, that sort of always go together. Um, and eventually, the goal in this lecture, the reason I chose this topic is, well, there are several reasons. Well, one of them, first of all, it is based on hyperelasticity or the formulation that we've seen in the mechanics of salt materials. So it makes a connection to that. When I talk about some formulations, you know what I'm saying because you've seen it before. Um, of course, as a special case, it would also apply to linear elasticity, which we had also seen before. Um, then you will see this concept of multiscale modeling that we've partially already seen in atomic to continuum scale transition. In other words, trying to deduce something about the macroscopic scale from what is going on on the microscopic scale. This is a concept that is already inherent in this topic. So we're going to somehow actually see um, uh, see, see, see some relevant concepts appearing here as well. Um, uh, and, and finally, when we talk about ideas of averaging that are also a naturally a part of this topic, you will see concepts that somehow are closely related to uh, the discussion of Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation. So you're going to see things that, uh, that you, you're going to see how uh, it links to uh, and complements some of the special topics that we have covered earlier. And that's why I think it's a good uh, topic to choose. Um, and it's quite broad. And I'll mention some of the possible applications. So even if you're interested in somehow dynamics or fluid mechanics or perhaps material science or solid mechanics per se, um, this topic essentially is applicable to all of those um, or finds applications in all of those uh, fields of interest. And eventually, of course, we will make use of the language of continuum mechanics. So we're going to demonstrate um, some equalities where the transitions follow from identities that we had seen before. And finally, one perhaps minor, but especially in this context, important uh, issue is boundary conditions. We've never discussed boundary conditions, right? Uh, so this will be one chance to at least expose ourselves to the importance of uh, boundary conditions. So let me uh, start off by our, again, usual picture. So we have a reference configuration, and we have a current configuration, and we're interested in somehow finding out how this motion occurs, or if we know what the motion is, we're interested in calculating um, other relevant um, quantities, like let's say stress. Um, well, now, The discussions we've followed, right, um, in the previous lectures, um, mostly assumed or did not give particular importance to the nature of the material within this domain. So yes, when we talked about atomic to continuum scale transition, we said, well, okay, this is what we see on the macro scale, but microscopically we see something else. We made a discussion about the, let me say, the fine scale nature of the material distribution or the structure of the material. When we talk about turbulence, we said, okay, there is only one fluid perhaps, but there are, there are fine scale oscillations due to the nature of turbulence. So we talked about also in that case, not the nature of the material, but the nature of the solution. So in this case, we're also going to now um, um, uh, talk about the, let me say, the fine scale or the microscopic scale of that domain. So notice, first of all, that if I would like to resolve or solve a problem that governs this motion, I already know how to do that. 
Um, so I have mass balance, linear momentum balance, angular momentum balance. And linear momentum balance, the input is the stress and the acceleration, of course, but the stress is related to the motion. Let's say you use a hyperelastic material model, if that is how the material behaves, and you have sufficient equations, sufficient unknown. So in principle, I know how to solve this problem. But let's see what happens if this material actually is not homogeneous. In other words, there isn't a single material here, but it has on the microscopic scale, multiple phases. So I'm zooming on to the vicinity of some point, okay? So this is some very, very small, small with respect to microscopic dimensions, small piece of the material. And I, under the microscope, let's say, try to see uh, what there is. And what there is is perhaps there are let's do it like this multiple phases there could be a black face there could be a green face there could be a blue face so this could be an alloy an alloy that has this composed of multiple phases um, it could be a a composite material where you intentionally introduce some heterogeneous heterogeneities, um, some some additional, let's say, particles or fibers, etc., and all of these are embedded in some surrounding material, which is the white face. Okay, so there is the white face, the blue face, the black face, and the green face, etc. Okay, so this one is the particle face. And this here would be the matrix phase. And let us call this a, a small volume that is associated with the vicinity of the point that I'm looking at. So in this context, I'm going to call it, because it's some volume, a calligraphic V, and that is the reference configuration of that um, volume, all right? So um, the examples that we could give, as I said, this could be, as an example, they could be alloys. Um, I could be talking about composites, particulate composites, fibrous composites. Um, I could be talking about porous media. Porous media, if you like, is just some foamy material, something like sponge, if you like. There's a connected solid phase, let's say, and inside there's a, uh, there is a pore structure that is also connected. So due to that connectivity, let's say, fluid or gas can diffuse through the porous media. Um, it could be biological tissue, which is somehow a, like a composite, but simultaneously a porous media. Um, you could have fluid particle mixtures. That you often find in technological applications or natural flows. Okay. Um, on, you can think about blood flow. There is a fluid and there's, there, there are um, particles within the fluid, deformable particles. So these could be the particles themselves could be rigid or deformable. So red cells are deformable, but if you're, let's say, in the swimming and you see the sand mixing with the, uh, the seawater, then that the, 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 the particles of the sand are, you can model as almost non-deformable, right? Um, and so on. So the, the um, examples are really um, numerous. Um, and, and what I like to highlight here is when I talk about a um, material that is on the microscopic scale, that, that has on the microscopic scale a complicated structure, a, a not a homogeneous but a 
what we call a heterogeneous structure, right? Multiple phases. Um, when I talk about structure, it has, it finds so, a, a, a application or it, it's relevant to many fields. Solid mechanics, uh, porous media, that is solid mechanics, but also fluid mechanics, if you'd like to resolve fluid flow in a complex porous domain. Biological tissue, likewise, it's a, it's a mixed field problem. Uh, fluid particle mixtures, et cetera. So you see biology, fluid mechanics, et cetera, in there, perhaps chemistry, often that, that, that finds applications in porous media. But our emphasis, right, among all of these, right, it will be the top two, okay? So in this problem, when I carry out my discussion, uh, I'm going to think that I have a structure on the microscopic scale. It has multiple phases, and all of those phases are solids, okay? Like, like a fibrous composite, if you like. So this is our emphasis. Now, having said that, and perhaps I'll highlight this once again, I'm going to talk about some concepts uh, that are inherently applicable to these topics as well. Okay, of course, the details vary. If you eventually want to carry out the types of simulations that I will talk about or computations, and these are complicated problems that rarely find analytical solutions, right? If you want to carry out such relevant computations, you have to have expertise in the particular area, let's say fluid mechanics, yes. But eventually the concepts that I will talk about are rather broad and applicable to each one of these. So, what, we've to what we're talking about is a material that is not homogeneous, but highly heterogeneous. Okay, so, versus homogeneous, right? And we call the structure or the material distribution, the shapes, the types of the particles that we have in here, um, it, we call that structure the microstructure. Okay. So in other words, here I have the macro scale, sort of let me, in some sense, divide it. Above here we have the macro scale, and down below, we have the micro scale. As I mentioned before, these are relevant length scales. So the reason that one, one calls this, if you like, the micro scale is because there is a huge order of magnitude be between the two. It doesn't necessarily mean that the length scales I'm talking about are of the order of uh, micrometers. All it means is that the sh sizes of these particles that I observe and the size of, the size of this um, this, this V naught, this element that I choose in the vicinity of that point is much, much smaller with respect to the dimensions of the structure that I'm trying to analyze. So now, then there is the motion and therefore this microstructure will also deform. And so when I look in the vicinity of the same point after deformation, all of these okay, points will move somewhere else, right? We will have the black face, it's not rigid, so it will deform. The green face as well, not necessarily rigid. And so on. Um, and now, what we can observe is that if I look at the displacement field, um, that is the current position minus the referential position, and from that I can calculate the displacement gradient, del u del capital X, and from that I can calculate the, if you like, the um, deformation gradient tensor, and as soon as I know what the deformation gradient tensor is, say I have hyperelasticity, I know what the stress distribution is. And the point to observe here is that um, due to this heterogeneous nature 
of the microstructure, this displacement field is not going to be uniform. Okay, so in other words, on the boundary, let's say, of the small element that I picked in the vicinity of the point, that point is not going to remain as a perfect line. It would remain as a perfect line after deformation if the deformation was uniform, which you have drawn several times in your homeworks. But in this case, there are particles here, stiffer particles here, softer particles there with respect to the matrix. So this boundary does not remain flat, but it tries to somehow ensure that whatever material there is in there, it remains in equilibrium and in order to ensure that it moves in this oscillatory manner. So this U field is highly oscillatory, hence H is, and hence F is, and hence the stress field is highly oscillatory. So now, if you would like to somehow solve this problem, okay, the deformation of this domain, with such a complicated microstructure, and this is just in the vicinity of this point, this structure is everywhere, right? So there are millions and billions of particles, if you like. So if you'd like to somehow resolve this motion, Numerically, you have to have an extremely fine grid, right? Just like the idea we talked about in, let's say, turbulence. And that's going to be super expensive. So if you want to solve this problem, it's very, very hard, okay? Um, of course, you can try to attempt it, and in simple cases, you can solve it if this domain is not too large, but in any case, it's very expensive. So the idea is to somehow look for a simplification, as we've done in the case of turbulence, right? And to do that, to look for a simplification, the first thing we need to do is, is to have an idea about this microstructure. And that you can do so from, let's say, experimental observations. You know what phases are. You know, let's say, the average volume fraction of every phase. So you can somehow try to characterize this microstructure. Okay? And then subsequently, you can try to model it for subsequent, uh, let's say, analysis for the purpose of simplifying this problem. So this microstructure is something that we need to model. Okay, And modeling consists of the morphology. In other words, what are the phases, what are their shapes, what are their distributions, and also how do they be, 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 um, um, behave? So are they elastic particles, are they viscoelastic particles, etc. Okay. So you have to know something about their mechanical behavior. Okay. And together, this is called micromechanical modeling. So that's the micromechanics aspect. You have to model what is going on on the micro scale. And we are taking it for granted at this stage. It's not an easy task, it's a task on its own. But what we are going to assume is we know what the microstructure is, we know how the materials behave, and all we're looking for is a way to simplify this pretty hard problem. So let me write that hard problem, let me formally define it, I will call it the heterogeneous, and the abbreviation is boundary value problem, okay? Um, and the heterogeneous boundary value problem is to determine the motion. So the X field, the position of every material point at any given time, so that we ensure that there is equilibrium okay. at every point within the domain. Now, we've never talked about boundary conditions, but there are two typical boundary conditions. Uh, these are not the only ones, but these are the ones that I will make use of. Uh, first, what you can say is on some portion of the boundary, you put a displacement boundary condition. Let's say you fix that point. You allow it not to move. Uh, you do not allow it to move. So that portion is the portion of the reference configuration that is associated with reference with, with displacement boundary conditions. So that's what it is, a displacement boundary condition. But what you can also do is you can put exert, let's say, some pressure on some other portion of the boundary. And the pressure is just a special case of a general traction condition where you can all have only not normal force per unit area on the boundary, but also tangential ones. That would be the traction that is capital PN. 
by definition. And what you can say is that that is prescribed to a certain value that may or may not be a constant on a portion of the boundary that is associated with these so-called traction boundary conditions. Okay, and once you endow the problem with traction boundary conditions, now it's well defined and you can go ahead and solve for that problem, right? Um, okay, now of course, to solve the problem that's not sufficient, we need closure, closure in the sense that I need sufficient equations for my um, unknowns, and that comes through the constitutive formulation. And what you will notice here is that I have on purpose put an x, which I had not done before. Previously, I said, okay, I'm at a certain point. I'm not interested in the distribution of some one or several materials within a domain. All I'm looking for is the relation between stress and deformation. But now I'm interested in the solution of a boundary value problem. Um, so I have a differential equation, boundary conditions, and I need the value of P for a given F, but that depends on where I'm at, because I might fall into the blue phase or the green phase or the black or the matrix, the white phase. So depending on where I am, the constitutive relation I'm using is different. Even if I have hyperelasticity, particles might be Ogden material and the other ones might be Neo-Hookian, for instance, right? They have different functional relations. So what this does is it highlights the heterogeneous nature of the uh, problem. And this is what makes the problem hard. The fact that the stress field is eventually going to oscillate rapidly because even if you change x tiny bit, um, the constitutive formulation is going to change because we are going to fall into a different material. And this difficulty is our emphasis now, okay? Not the microstructure characterization. Specifically, this part is our emphasis. Now, you might have noticed that I've done a simplification here. And that simplification is for the purpose of making our discussion a little bit more concise. Um, and for sure, I've omitted some important terms like body forces. Okay. Um, body forces, it turns out, they can be incorporated. So I've assumed that there are none. Uh, but they can be incorporated into the discussion that I'm about to uh, follow. So. I'm just going to here say can be included with little difficulty, uh, but I've also omitted accelerations. And now acceleration is a little bit tricky. Uh, if you have mild accelerations, then it's not a problem. But if you have very severe, let me say, acceleration, in severe in the sense that you have something like a shock front, a shock wave, uh, propagating through the material, then it's a little bit tricky in the context of the topic that we are uh, analyzing. So I'm also omitting acceleration. Again, mild magnitudes, let me say, whatever that means, I've tried to give you an example, mild magnitudes can be included, let's say, without difficulty. But if they are severe, then one has to be careful. Okay, so that's our problem. And what I've told you already in words is that this problem is very hard. It's quite demanding. Um, computationally, let's say, because Even if the problem is homogeneous, you rarely have analytical solutions. But in particular, these days, you are interested in the computational complexity. Okay? So that is very demanding. And so we look for a simplification. And that simplification is where the second part of the topic, namely the concept of homogenization, comes in. And 
actually, um, the idea is quite simple. And it's an idea that we already do it on a daily basis in engineering, okay? So in engineering, suppose I'm going to construct, right, um, the hull of a car, right? Uh, the, 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 the uh, let's say, the frame, and you're using some aluminum alloy. It's an alloy, so if you look at it, it has a fine microstructure. But you don't try to go ahead and resolve that microstructure. Instead, what you do is you take the material, you test it, okay, let's say in the under tension testing, and you try to find out how the material behaves in that experimental setup on your scale. That's the macroscopic scale. You try to somehow not think about the microscopic details, but also only try to get an idea or a feeling about the apparent behavior of the material on the macroscopic scale. So, so, so presently, so in this context, what we could do is, I could take, is this, is this the domain that I'm trying to analyze? Yes, I take a piece of the material and I do a tension test on it. There are all these complexities and I could do that test numerically as well. And that's precisely in fact what we're going to do in some sense. And then try to extract the macroscopic, let's say, the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, et cetera, that is associated with this test specimen. And then forget about this complexity. Think of this as some homogeneous material that is, that is not complex anymore, and then solve this simpler problem on a very coarse numerical grid. That's the idea. Now, of course, the material is actually heterogeneous. You're making that simplification on the macroscopic scale only for practical purposes. So what you are dealing with now is not really a homogeneous material, but one that is just conceptually homogenized. And that's where the concept homogenization comes in. Okay. So, um, if I can find my black pencil, there it is. That's not it. There it is. Um, so, so the aim, or we aim to find, if you like, characterize the macroscopic or apparent behavior of the heterogeneous material. Okay, that's what we aim to do. And then of course, once we find it, we want to make use of it because our goal was to solve a problem that was originally hard. And then now we want to solve a, uh, Simpler problem, problem. So use as if, okay, as if the material was homogeneous. So what we're doing, and here we can make a link, link conceptually to what we had, a, a concept that we've seen before. We are making a transition from one scale, a fine scale of the problem, um, to the macroscopic scale, and we're going to use homogenization as a tool. So in this case, the microscopic scale is also a continuum. Um, we have continuous particles, um, each of which is a continuum, particles embedded in some matrix, let's say, a continuum on the micro scale, a continuum on the macro scale. So we have a continuum to continuum transition. versus the atomic to continuum scale transition, for instance, that we had um, seen before. And now I will introduce a notation that I will follow in subsequent um, um, derivations. So I will indicate a quantity. This could be the stress or deformation gradient. I'm just choosing a generic uh, entity here, scalar entity A. Uh, so without any specific notation on it, this refers to the micro scale, and if I, ref if I put a bar on it, okay, if I put a bar on it, it just means that it's the macro scale counterpart of the same entity, okay? What A bar exactly is, is something we're going to define, okay? It just refers to the macro scale 
So now all that's left is now we have the idea at hand. Uh, we have to construct the details of this, um, of this idea called homogenization. Now, eventually, how would you, uh, what, what is the type of behavior that you would expect? Let's discuss that slightly, very briefly. So for instance, if you have, in the context of our emphasis, we have on the microscale, micro, um, solid, solid microstructure. And on the microscale, therefore, I have some solid formulation. So in other words, if everything on the microscale is hyperelastic, or in general, elastic, I would expect that on the macroscale, I also have some elastic law that governs stress and strain, okay? Uh, and I need to find the effective or, let me say, macroscopic or apparent elastic, elasticity tensor, okay? Uh, so that, that is our emphasis. Suppose you're interested in flow through porous media. So on the micro scale, then you have some porous skeleton uh, that may or may not be deformable. And within, through that uh, skeleton flows a fluid, right? So the fluid is governed by Navier-Stokes, but we've already said in that case, probably you're going to be dealing with Stokes flow because inertia is negligible. And then, so you have Stokes flow formulation for the fluid and let's say rigid uh, skeleton. And then you do homogenization on that. And it turns out what you obtain on the macro scale is some material, in this case the fluid, diffusing through the porous skeleton, some surrounding material. And you have diffusion only if you have pressure gradients. And that is precisely what is described by a Darcy's law. A Darcy's law says that the rate of the flux of the fluid or diffusion, okay, you might remember from fluid mechanics, is associated with the gradients of the pressure. So homogenization gives you that law. Okay, and so on. So for different sort of um, applications that you might be interested in, you have interesting macroscopic behavior or laws emanating from the procedure of homogenization. So we're going to now follow it uh, in the context of continuum to continuum scale transition where the micro scale and the macro scale are both solids. Okay. Um, so, now, I have stated the heterogeneous boundary value problem. Suppose we accomplish that goal, which we're about to start very shortly, then what we want to do is solve, hopefully, a simpler problem, which is going to be the homogenized boundary value problem. So, that problem, it turns out, is not different. It is certainly simpler, but not that different from the original one. I still want to resolve the motion of the particles associated with them, some smeared out or homogenized continuum. Uh, and that continuum has some referential configuration. And of course, it still needs to satisfy equilibrium, but this time with some macroscopic stress tensor distribution um, in the reference configuration. And there are going to be boundary con bond conditions. Now, Depending on the problem that we're looking at, the boundary conditions may also be subject to the procedure of homogenization. But in this context, I'm going to keep it simple and simply say that, well, the problem that I'm trying to solve is described by equilibrium and boundary conditions. I'm not trying to modify my problem, so the boundary conditions remain the same. Yes, I'm trying to solve for some homogenized um, deformation of the continuum, but the boundary conditions are what they were before. I kept one end of the domain fixed, I will do so again, okay? Um, and on one portion of the boundary, I applied a, let's say, pressure, and I will do so again, okay? But now the traction is described in terms of the macroscopic stress. So I have a macroscopic traction onto which I apply that boundary condition, okay? And the critical part is that now I don't have to address the heterogeneous nature because I've already homogenized it. And therefore, I'm trying to resolve only some macroscopic stress field, which hopefully is not going to be highly oscillatory, unlike the original heterogeneous problem, okay? So this here is, however, the missing link. 
This is precisely what I'm trying to find out. If I know this, the rest can be immediately solved for. But I don't know what that is. What I know is the microscopic scale behavior. I know how every phase behaves, but I don't know this macroscopic or apparent constitutive behavior of the heterogeneous material. Okay? Um, so the critical thing is, however, in any case, uh, that I don't have any more X dependence. That's what makes the problem simpler or computationally, let's say, cheaper. Okay, so maybe I should write down a few things I said. So we do use the same boundary conditions. That, that's my abbreviation for it. Same boundary conditions. Uh, we do need to invoke macroscopic equilibrium. That's something that always needs to be satisfied. And the missing link is our macroscopic constitutive formulation. That's what we need to find out to solve this homogenized boundary value problem. Okay, so this is what we must find out. All right, so that's the idea, right? And I've already told you the way of finding out that macroscopic constitutive behavior is to do testing. And we're going to do that in a theoretical, and eventually one could embed that in a computational environment. So let's talk about how to find the relation between F bar and P bar. Namely, how do we do material testing? But material testing, not in a tension test machine, let's say, but in a theoretical computational environment. And this is sometimes called computational homogenization because often you do need to resort to numerical methods. Okay. And so the idea is just like testing a material in, an, in a laboratory, you need to take a sample from your specimen, from your heterogeneous material, the thing that you're trying to make use of in constructing a, a, a problem or a structure. And that sample is going to be our volume, V naught. And in that volume, so I won't make it very fancy, but let's say if we have a particular microstructure, a white matrix and black particles, this could be a sample that I pick. Okay? And I'm going to now do somehow pull on it, deform it, and try to find the relation between stress and Deformation. Now, this is something that needs to be representative of what is going on in the microstructure, in the sense that, so if we look at our original microstructure, right, um, there are a, there is a particle distribution, and that particle distribution might be very, very dense on one side of the domain. Let's say the volume fraction of the particles could be 60%, whereas on the other side of the domain, uh, it could be only 5%. There are scarcely any particles. So in that case, I cannot really endow the whole thing with a single material because the fact that there are denser particles there perhaps renders the material stronger there and weaker there, right? So I'm going to make an assumption for the purpose, again, of our discussion. I'm going to say that the particles are uniformly distributed everywhere, which means that irrespective of where I pick that sample, I'm going to see the same picture, okay? So that is called statistical homogeneity, in other words, when I pick a volume element and I, and I look at what is inside, it looks roughly the same, irrespective of where I pick that sample. So it won't look exactly the same because perhaps the distribution of these particles are random. So let's say I can draw a nut. let's say I can draw two statistically equivalent particle distributions, each of which has six particles or seven particles. Okay. 
So you look at them, they don't look all that different, but they both have seven particles and I could draw, let's say, a thousand of such realizations and all of them would look more or less the same. In other words, versus that and some strange, every time you pick, you see, let's say, ellipsoids or let's say voids appearing in the microstructure, every time you look you see a different microstructure that is not statistically homogeneous. So wherever I look, I see the same microstructure. Okay. So let me actually draw, erase this. And that microstructure that is representative of the microscale is called a representative volume element. Or an RV. Okay, um, and eventually I will have some field over that microstructure like deformation or stress, and I will define averaging for a quantity that is oscillatory over the microstructure, right? We've discussed that the displacement and therefore its gradient and therefore the stress oscillates rapidly as I move across that microstructure from point to point due to the presence of these particles. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to extract some mean value for those oscillations. And that is how I indicate it. But this time, unlike runs, it's not going to be some type of time averaging, but it's going to be volume averaging. Okay? So average of a oscillatory quantity is going to be defined as, that indicates the volume of the domain, okay? magnitude of V0 integral over V not the quantity itself. And notice that I'm averaging over the reference configuration of the microstructure. Okay, so this is a volume average. And I am going to continuously invoke this um, volume averaging operation in what follows. Okay, so now the core idea of material testing is, as I've said, you somehow um, try to find a relation between deformation and stress, okay? So first of all, I'm going to impose a deformation. The deformation is something that has to do with the macroscopic motion of the particles. The macroscopic motion of the homogenized continuum is described by X bar, and therefore there is a deformation gradient associated with it, which is F bar. Okay? And I'd like to know the corresponding apparent stress of the microstructure under that macroscopic deformation gradient. And therefore, somehow, I must impose this deformation gradient on the microstructure, which might be as simple as simply pulling on that microstructure by a prescribed amount. Okay? But in general, it could also include shearing, etc., and it could be in 3D. So I need to somehow impose that deformation on the microstructure so that okay, um, I link the microscopic deformation field to this quantity that I'm going to try to impose. I need a relation between how this deforms and what I'm trying to impose. And I'm going to impose that or make that relation between the average value of F and what I'm trying to impose. Okay? So I'm going to say that I'm going to deform the microstructure or I'm going to impose F bar such that, and if you like, just put your pencils down for a second and let's be careful here because this is the critical uh, point here. Um, I, I know what I'm trying to impose, but how am I going to impose it, right? And I'm going to say that I'm going to deform the microstructure in such a way that after I calculate the volume average of the microscopic deformation gradient, it comes out to be what I'm trying to impose. Okay? This is just one choice. Okay? Um, so, so if you like, you could say that there is an oscillatory displacement field, and I'm going to deform it in such a way that the average of the oscillatory displacement field in a tension test is a macroscopic displacement value that I'm trying to impose, okay? So it's similar to that, but in this case, it's a tensorial quantity, right? Average of F has to be equal to what I'm trying to put in. Now, then what are you trying to measure? You've deformed it by a certain amount. What you're trying to calculate is the stress, right? 
And how will I measure stress? Because it oscillates rapidly across the microstructure. Which stress am I dealing with? No particular value at some specific point. I'm only interested in the average stress. Okay? So I impose a deformation and I measure the stress as a volume average as well. So impose a given deformation as a volume average, measure the macroscopic volume stress as a volume average. This is material testing within a computational setting. Sounds actually pretty simple. I don't know how I will impose it yet, but I know how to measure it once I accomplish that, let me say, constraint. Okay. So these are our macroscopic or our fundamental macroscopic quantities. One fundamental macroscopic quantity is the deformation gradient. It's defined as a volume average, and it's a kinematical quantity. And another one is the stress. It's also defined as a volume average, and it's a kinetic quantity. Okay. All right, well, suppose I do this. So I impose the deformation and I measure the stress. So what? Well, so what is the following? You plot, let's say, the value of F that you're trying to impose and the value of P that you measure from your sample in a numerical setting, and you collect data. And your data is, of course, if the deformation is identity, there is zero stress, so you start here. And then you deform, there is a stress, you deform further. And that's your data. And what you can do now is you can fit a line through it, you can pick a model. Let's say you pick the Ogden material model. Um, if this thing macroscopically behaves indeed isotropically. You pick the Ogden material hyperelasticity model, and there are many free parameters, remember, there. You can choose those parameters or determine them so that the model fit follows these, this data as closely as possible. It may not follow it perfectly, uh, so that will introduce some modeling error, but still, it might be very close, so that's your model fit. And the model fit describes the relation between P bar and F bar. And now you have a relation. And now once you have the relation, now you can go back to your homogenized boundary value problem. Have a look here for a second. Right? You can go back to this problem. This was the missing link, and now I know it. And now I can solve this problem. Okay? And it's easier to solve, remember, again, because it's homogenized and there are no oscillations in the microscopic or strong oscillations in the microscopic field. Okay? So, so that's, that's what we're going to do. Okay? Okay. Um, I should make a short remark here that is important. So notice that We've defined these so-called fundamental macroscopic quantities as volume averages. Not every macroscopic quantity is a volume average, and that's precisely why we have called these fundamental ones. So let me give you an example, and I'll squeeze it in here. Um, and I will say A bar, so a given macroscopic quantity, is not always the volume average of its microscopic counterpart. Okay. Okay. So, for instance, uh, there are other kinematical measures, strain measures. You could be interested in the value of the macroscopic Lagrangian strain tensor. This is not the volume average of its microscopic counterpart, but it is defined in terms of 
what I picked for F bar. F bar is a volume average. If I know the microscopic F, I volume average it, I find out what the microscopic F bar is. And subsequently, do you, know, do you want to calculate E bar? Well, you do it in the way you had done before. It's F bar transpose F bar minus identity. Okay? So you employ the classical uh, continuum relations in that sense. And similarly, if you would like to calculate the macroscopic second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor, it is not a volume average. You've already defined P bar and F bar, so you define it S bar also in terms of those, namely it is P F bar transpose. Nobody's correcting me, so I'll correct myself. F inverse P. Okay. Um, so, so these are called. Um, Not fundamental, but rather derived macroscopic quantities. Okay. All right, well, we're in good shape. So we know the idea. We know that somehow we need to test a representative sample from this microstructure, from this heterogeneous material, and try to characterize the macroscopic stress deformation relation, and eventually make use of it on the micro scale to render the solution of that problem much less costly compared to the original problem setup. Okay. Uh, so, of course, to solve for, for a given F bar, to solve for the stress field so that I can average it, I need to determine what that stress field is. And that stress field comes from also the solution of a boundary value problem. So you, we need to somehow re resolve that stress field. And that stress field, therefore, in our con con context, needs to also satisfy equilibrium. So I'm going to say it must satisfy equilibrium. That is the ideal scenario, of course. But in fact, I'm going to uh, discuss one case where that condition is relaxed. But in general, the stress field is always the one that corresponds to equilibrium, and in this case, to microscopic equilibrium. So I'm trying to do testing on the microstructure in a numerical setting. And that entails solving the following problem. I'm trying to determine the deformation of the microstructure of that representative volume element, the RVE, so that the microscopic stress field within that microstructure satisfies equilibrium, ideally. And there is a boundary condition. In this case, the boundary condition is imposed in a very, let me say, vague manner. All I want is that the deformation field is such that it is somehow equal to the deformation that I'm trying to impose. Because I want to say I pulled by that much and I measured that stress. So, but the deformation field is heterogeneous, so I'm trying to make a link between micro and macro scales in this average sense. And to solve for the problem, of course, I have a stress-strain relation for every particle and matrix uh, domain within the RV. Okay? Now, when you look at this problem, apart from the boundary conditions, of course, it looks very similar to the original problem. In particular, the difficulty associated with the heterogeneity is still there. But remember, this is a small domain. It's not huge. There are only, let's say, a thousand particles in there versus millions of particles in the original problem. So this problem is feasible to solve. Okay? I can solve it. Um, 
So it's say, small problem, it's feasible to solve. And the critical part is, of course, to a little bit more discuss this vague imposition of the deformation that I'm trying to achieve in an average sense. And I'm going to call this the F-bar condition because I haven't told you how one could possibly satisfy that condition, uh, but very shortly you will see that. This condition is the link between the kinematics of the macro and micro scales. And that is the only remaining difficulty. And that's what we will now concentrate on. Essentially, what we are saying is to, to sort of, again, summarize once again from a different perspective, I have a highly heterogeneous deformation, and conceptually suppose I know what it is. I look in the vicinity of a macroscopic point. I pick a volume. There are tons of particles in there, etc. The deformation field is highly heterogeneous. And I, what I want to say is I want to associate with that macroscopic point a deformation gradient. And I make that association as a volume average of what is going on on that tiny volume in the vicinity of that point I'm looking at. So that is the sense in which I'm linking the kinematics between macroscopic and microscopic scales. And similarly, I want to say that I, want, I need a relation between the stresses. Again, I associate the volume average of the stress to be the stress at that point macroscopically somehow smeared out. I don't think about the details. I'm only looking at the mean value, the average. Of course, there are oscillations around it, but that is precisely the nature of simplification. I'm not interested in those oscillations at least in the first step. I'm only interested in mean values, and once I deal with mean values, just like in runs, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, I hope to be able to then deal with this problem in a much cheaper fashion, right? That's the goal. So I know what to do to determine that relation. I need to do testing. This is the computational problem that you have to solve on your RVE. And everything is well defined. Everything looks standard, except that I have this strange boundary condition, which is called the F-bar condition. I need to ensure that after deformation, the average deformation gradient in the RVE is equal to my input. So now we will discuss how to achieve that. And this is perhaps our only chance of discussing boundary conditions in some context. Um, in general, actually, not in only in micromechanics, but in general. So let us look at how to satisfy the F-bar condition. And it turns out there isn't only one way, but there are multiple ways of doing that. Okay. And to analyze this, I'm going to define a few quantities. First of all, I'm going to define something called X tilde. It's sort of like an oscillatory field, but oscillatory field that is defined in the following way. Okay? Every point in the um, RVE, the domain that I'm computationally testing, has a spatial position after deformation. And I'm trying, I'm not calculating the difference between that and a uniform deformation hypothesis, which would be, which you will remember from cauchy born hypothesis to be F bar X, okay? This is a uniform deformation, but that's not how the microstructure deforms. The difference is some oscillatory field. Now, what I can do is I can calculate the gradient of that oscillation. And on the left-hand side, you have a quantity which let us call F tilde. Okay. Um, here you have F, and here you have F bar. Okay. And now, what I can do is, I can apply volume averaging 
to both sides of that equation. So I will volume average that as well as that. And I will obtain average F tilde is equal to average F minus F bar. Now let me ask you a question. Is that equal to zero? Why? Yes, we hope that it is. That is the condition that we are trying to impose. So if we impose that condition correctly, then average f will be equal to f bar, and it will be equal to, therefore, 0, f tilde average. But if we make a mistake in our imposition, and if we do not satisfy that, let me say, constraint, then this is not satisfied and it will not be equal to zero. So the condition that it is equal to zero is equivalent to saying that I satisfy the f-bar condition, okay? So this must be zero. And here I'm highlighting if uh, f-bar condition is satisfied. So I must be careful eventually that I um, satisfy it. Um, now, similarly, I can define a oscillatory traction field. And the idea is somewhat similar. So there is the actual traction field, just like the actual position. Uh, and I take its difference, or I subtract from it, a sort of a mean value. In this case, the mean value is described with respect to the macroscopic stress operating on a normal at which, or with which you're trying to calculate the traction, okay? So uh, if the normal does not change on a certain boundary, let's say I have my domain, the RVE, on that surface and does not change, and p bar is a constant, and therefore on that surface you have a single mean value, but the traction can highly be can be highly oscillatory because I have particles in there, etc., and the deformation in the spatial configuration is very heterogeneous. So p is not equal to that; it will be uh, non-zero in general. So this is associated with some oscillatory stress field, if you like. There is a macroscopic p, or sorry, capital P tilde multiplying n gives you p tilde, and this of course is p n, and this is p bar n. Now here there is no doubt, I am defining p bar to be average p. So from this, if I average both sides and I forget about n because that's a uniform multiplier, average p tilde is equal to average p minus p bar is equal to zero by our definition of p bar. Okay. Because I'm not trying to ensure somehow that p bar is average p. That's my definition. Once I satisfy the f bar condition, and I solve my problem, I will obtain a microscopic stress field over the RVE, I average it, and I obtain p bar. So this is the definition, that equals that, and therefore the volume average of the oscillatory stress field is equal to uh, zero by construction. So, now, next time, right, so we will concentrate on that remaining difficulty of satisfying the f-bar condition based on these relations that I have written. Okay? And we will see specifically three types of boundary conditions that are of practical and theoretical uh, interest. <laughs>